Welcome to our holiday meal prep class. We think this is important every year to do because what we found is that, you know, patients who are on program, this is that slippery slope time of year where it's Thanksgiving, then Christmas, and then New Year's, and then like you could even keep going <laughs> Valentine's Day. Like you can find lots of excuses and reasons to fall off the bandwagon or postpone care altogether, right? So um, go ahead and put, um, pull out your notes. The reason why we have this conversation is because what we know is um, statistics show us that the average person gains five to eight pounds between this time of the year and the end of the year. And so we just encourage our patients not to become a statistic because I'm going to quote Captain Stephanie Lincoln, my friend. Um, she founded Fireteam Whiskey. You've seen the um, keto-friendly shakes and bars. So we were working out last night and she used the analogy that um, if you were going to eventually have to dig yourself out of a hole, why would you keep digging, right? So you just keep digging yourself deeper and deeper and deeper, and you know eventually you're going to have to climb out of that hole. She's like, so eventually you should just stop digging if you were smart, right? So that's to quote her. But what we found as we started doing some research for tonight's event is that the average Thanksgiving meal is 3,000 calories. That's way more than the average person should have in a day. Like, I should be on twelve to 1,500 calories because I'm fairly active. And then people who work out more should be on about 2,000. Really, only, like, bodybuilders would be on 3,000 calories a day. And what we know about the Thanksgiving meal is those are not nutritionally dense calories. They're very nutritionally poor calories. So... And then that number, 3,000 calories per Thanksgiving meal, that doesn't include seconds, right? So what do we normally do? <laughs> we have the meal nice and early, we go into our turkey coma, and then we're like, whoa, I think I should do that all over again. We can make, put the turkey on and bread this time and make a turkey sandwich, right? Okay, so don't be a turkey. So I want to give you some tips for success. First of all, um, and then we're going to just talk about some coping strategies and some healthy substitutions because, like you just tasted, there's plenty of healthy varieties and versions of your favorite recipes that you can fix that your family will love and is still delicious and that you don't have to completely forego the holidays or be a total like party pooper or, you know, feel guilty or embarrassed that you're trying to stay on program and do well for yourself this time of year. So some tips for success, um, what you'll know is that organic turkeys run out really early, right? So you need to pre-order so that you can get yourself an organic turkey. Why do you think that's so important? No hormones, no antibiotics. Right. So they, it's a whole industry. If you think, why do we only eat turkey once a year? because it's a commercialization, and so they're preparing those turkeys, fattening, up, fattening them up and making them humongous and fat and juicy so that they can sell them all at Thanksgiving time. Well, that's an industry, and so in order to get these huge 25 pound plus turkeys, they have to give them growth hormone and all sorts of yucky stuff, and usually they're grain fed because that makes them fat. So they give animals grains to make them fat, just like if we eat a lot of greens and carbs, it makes us fat. See the analogy? Okay, so organic is especially important because turkeys absolutely are commercially gr grown and raised so that they can be big. So when you get an organic turkey, it's like this little cute thing, right? Because <laughs> that's the size the turkey naturally gets if it's not fed all this garbage to be a big plump. We won't name names, turkey, right? Okay, so plan ahead. Get your orders in. Um, pick a day to shop and prep. This really goes along with our normal meal prep um, suggestions. So a lot of this is like if you can prep and do a lot of the hard work before your company shows up, then you can have a strategy and you can take some time to be purposeful in what you're doing instead of rushing and freaking out or having family members in your kitchen and having them sabotage your best efforts at serving a healthy meal because they have the, all their ideas and traditions and favorite things that they want to try to slide into the menu, right? So pick a day to prep. Um, Thanksgiving is on a Thursday, so Sunday won't usually work for Thanksgiving, but if you can make some of these dishes ahead of time, your side dishes and whatnot, then you're all ready to go. Then you only have to really worry about the turkey the day of and the stuffing and keeping things warm. Um, 
in a time crunch, a lot of people have a lot of people at their houses. You can use shopping services, so that can save time. So Shipt is one of our favorite, but there's Instacart. There's all sorts of different grocery delivery services now. Um, you can put your order in on your phone and pick a delivery time, and they'll actually go do your shopping and bring it to your door. It's awesome. It's really great. And so we, um, because I am a member of Shipt, we have a promo code on the sheet, so if you go to the SHIP website that we listed and put this promo code in, you'll get $50 off. And so that's awesome because that's actually half of the annual membership. So it's the same price as like a Costco membership and they bring all your stuff to you. And not just at Thanksgiving, but all day, all week long. So it's awesome, like you could be at work on lunch hour and be like, oh my gosh, I didn't meal prep on Sunday, that was me this week. I was out with my friends in Fort Lauderdale. We got home Sunday night. Who cares about grocery shopping at that point? And so I put my order in shift and the groceries were there when I got home. So that was really helpful. Um, make a plan for the entire week. So including like leftovers, what you're gonna do to set yourself up. And then what happens when we have holidays is like we put all of our effort and attention on the holiday meal and then the whole rest of our week goes to heck in a hand basket because we're just like well whatever and we're on the fly and we're convenience food and we're just really only thinking about the Thanksgiving meal. Um, cook one, these are, some of these notes like I said are from our normal meal prep but you could apply it to the Thanksgiving meal as well. So cooking one main protein, most people's main protein is gonna be the turkey, and then try to cook it three different ways. So there's all sorts of recipes that you can use the leftover turkey. You can make a soup, you can make a bone broth out of it, um, you can make turkey salad out of it. There's lots of things that you can repurpose it for that's a lot healthier than continuing to plop it on top of a big lump of potatoes and smothering it with gravy for the next five days. <laughs> so always having a plan. Um, have good storage containers available. So this is a really good because Thanksgiving, did you ever notice that you always cook way more than you need? Mm. What is it about this meal? <laughs> <laughs> you And so if you have storage containers on hand, like disposable ones or ones that you don't mind lending out depending on who your company is, then you can just send all those leftovers home with your friends and family so it's not sitting around tempting you for the next week so that you don't keep having 3,000 calorie meals for the next five days or whatever. Um, anytime that you're making recipes, if you're cooking, we always say like if you're chopping vegetables, chop extra and put it in a freezer bag or put it in the fridge and then that's something later in the week that you can just pull out and cook or cook extra so that you have leftovers. So that's what we do is we try to make a, a big batch of a bunch of stuff that we can either repurpose or that we have, at least have it prepped to make the next meal for the week so that every night of the week isn't a big chore or a project. When you are searching, we are gonna include some of the recipes that you had tonight and then we're gonna send out an email that'll have some of the additional recipes for like green bean casserole and um, some keto bread and things like that that are healthy alternatives. But if you put the words um, low carb or paleo or keto in front of your search bar, so like what we did for the pumpkin pie is we put um, paleo or gluten free um, pumpkin pie and then you'll start getting all these recipes that incorporate healthier lower carbohydrate ingredients especially if you put the word keto because keto is going to incorporate high fats and be very low carb so just put that in front of whatever word like if you're looking for you know stuffing or green bean casserole or sweet potato casserole or whatever it is you're trying to make um, and then make plenty of non-traditional dishes so I think everybody thinks like you've got to have stuffing potatoes you know, the turkey, everything's white. Did you notice that? Uh -huh. <laughs> the Thanksgiving meal is very non-colorful. So get some Brussels sprouts, put some beets on the table, get some sweet potatoes or squash, you know, put some color on there and fill up on the veggies. You can make a huge salad so that people eat the salad beforehand. Or if you're going to a family member's house and you're worried about like, what are you gonna eat when you're there? You know, you bring the foods that you can eat. So the salad, you can, spruce it up and put some sweet potato or some cran you know dried cranberries some pumpkin seeds make it seasonal and fun put some if you put like bacon on anything your family's like oh wow it's so gourmet you know so <laughs> fancy <laughs> so just put bacon and cranberries and call it thanksgiving salad and they'll be like wow it's so fancy um and then what we know is that eating at someone else's house it's one thing right if you're the one that's 
you're the one that's hosting it and you have control over the menu and all and then maybe people are just bringing onesie twosie items but if you're going to somebody else's house obviously that can put you in a predicament where you're like okay i don't have a whole lot of control or i don't want to complain or i don't want to be that guest that they have to like bend over backwards or make special accommodations for so that can kind of put you in a tricky spot and then you lose control over your ability to stay on program so we've got some um, suggestions. Bring two to three dishes to pass. So everybody thinks like, oh, I'll just bring one thing. But if you have a lot of sensitivities or restrictions or you're on one of the higher carb restriction diets based on your health condition and your weight loss goals, um, you're gonna have to bring more than one dish. What we suggest is if you brought an appetizer, maybe something towards the main meal and, um, and a side dish, then you're pretty well covered. You've got your meal covered, and then you might sample just to be kind some of the other things or take a few bites, but you won't overindulge on all those higher starchy items because you're well taken care of. Um, another idea if you're eating at someone else's house is to eat before you go. It sounds kind of funny, but at least just have like a protein shake or a half a protein That's shake. Amazing. Yeah, get your belly full. Then you're not starving and those food cravings don't kick in and like it's so easy to just reach for, you know, the cookies or the second helping of something. And then we say arm yourself for awkward conversation, right? So a lot of times the strategy is sure we teach people like how to eat and what to eat and how to stay satisfied while they're on a program but a lot of the coaching is like how do you deal with the people in your life that are not also on a program and when we start new patients we tell them right off the bat your friends and family and co-workers will sabotage you and your best efforts and intention at staying on program and there's a reason behind that you know human psychology is that they're gonna put you down in an effort to make themselves right and to you know, make them feel better about their poor eating choices. So they don't do it to be mean, but it's kind of like a self-preservation thing, right? So if you're doing so great and feeling so well and they're not, now they start to compare themselves to you and they're like, well, what's wrong with what I eat? And I hear this all the time, like when Al Captain Stephanie Lincoln again last night, we, were, we both are on this topic with our clients and patients, obviously, to keep them on program. And she said, you know, like somebody literally was like, you know, like we're all, we're pretty thin and fit and in shape. And so they think like, wow, like if you're on a low carb diet, you must think I'm a whale if you need to lose weight. And it's just like ridiculous comments like that, that where you're like, now you feel bad or awkward because here you are trying to do the right thing. So we say, just know that those conversations are about to happen. If you need to role play with somebody in the car or script it out or write it down on a little card, like what you're gonna say, but here's some of my solutions. You know, just state that you're on, you're on a nutrition program and the focus is low carbs. And so, you know, what I'll say, a lot of these kind of hit the same point. I try to make it very medical, right? So one of them is, you know, say that you have food sensitivities or allergies and that you can't have certain foods and that you know, you're know you under the uh, doctor's supervision. I always say like, when in doubt, like blame it on me. Like I'm okay being the awkward, unpopular person. I don't really care. <laughs> I think that's why God put me on this planet in this, in this role is I don't care if I'm the awkward one. It's good, but I'm good with it. Um, but telling them that, making it medical, you know, I think in our today's world and society, it's very common that we understand that we have peanut-free classrooms and there's people with celiac disease and restaurants are very accommodating for food allergies and doing gluten-free and all this kind of stuff. That's just the day and age that we live in. So I don't think it's as awkward as it used to be as that becomes, unfortunately, the societal norm. Um, but it makes it less offensive or less like you're judging them when you're just like, we're doing this as a family or give your testimony you know nobody can ever argue with you witnessing that you feel better you've lost weight you concentrate better at work your kids behave better and are doing better in school whatever you you guys all have your own stories you're all here and on program and staying on program because you continue to feel better and do well so your testimony could be a light to other people and encourage and motivate them to start incorporating some healthy changes. You know, suddenly they're like, wow, you look great. Yeah, you are like five pounds later than you were last Thanksgiving or, you know, they see the changes in you. So just know that you could use it, turn it around to be encouragement for somebody else. 
And I said, blame your doctor, of course. <laughs> Just blame me. Um, the next little part on your notes is some substitutions, and I think this will drive some conversations and maybe some questions that you guys might have. Um, substitutions, um, does anybody know what that cool whip stuff is? It's, it's all sorts of crazy stuff. <laughs> so if you haven't been to one of our reading labels classes, you might want to come to one. We've got a little demonstration of some of the common um, labels that you'll see out there. But Cool Whip definitely is got some weird sweeteners, weird oils and stuff in there. It's really bad stuff. Um, but you can actually make your own whipped cream very easily. So if you get organic heavy cream or even like the full fat coconut milk in the can and pour some of the liquid off of it, um, you can whip it. You use the beaters and you just put some liquid stevia and some vanilla and it's delicious. Like it's so much better. And it actually stays whipped for a long time so you can use it later like for, you know, putting dipping some like berries which is a low glycemic fruit in there. So we encourage that. Potatoes. Has anybody joined the cauliflower craze? <laughs> yeah. Did you know you can make even cake with cauliflower? We didn't do that to you tonight. Uh, <laughs> carrot cake. Yeah, we didn't do that to you guys tonight. But um, Charlie Harvey, who works here as an associate, she's our little cauliflower queen. She, <laughs> she's always trying cauliflower and all the different recipes. So shout out to Charlie. Um, and that is, was her recipe, the mashed cauliflower that's out there. So some people are like, oh, I hate cauliflower, I can't stand it. So that's why we made it tonight, so you could at least try it. Because sometimes you think, you, you know, you have these old habits and things. When you're on a program, your palate will change. So as you're doing this, I do encourage you to go back and try foods that you thought you, you know, were like an absolute no for you, because you might find that they actually taste different to you. I had that experience. I, I still don't really like peppers, but now I'll eat like red or yellow peppers. Green peppers, eh. I never used to like bananas. Beets definitely tasted like dirt to me. You know, and now I enjoy most of those things. So it's just funny how your taste for things change. Um, anything for baking, if you're using traditional baking flour, you can always find an alternative recipe using coconut and or almond flour. Um, a lot of the gluten-free recipes, I will tell you, you usually have to combine a couple of different types of flour in order to get the right consistency. If you use all, you know, coconut flour, that tends to absorb water a lot more than traditional flour, and it'll really dry out. So that's why you're going to see with the, some of the recipes when you Google them, usually a combination of flours to get the right consistency. Sugar! You all know I love, I hate sugar, right? <laughs> Even if you haven't ever been to a class. Sugar, so of course, if you're going to use one of these sugar substitutes, I'm not talking about all, um, artificial sweeteners, of course. Stevia does not raise your glycemic index, um, so it doesn't raise your blood sugar is what that means. The rest still will raise your blood sugar. So maple syrup. Um, coconut palm sugar, you can use dates. A lot of pie crusts actually use dates with almond flour or almond meal, and that's the natural sweetener, but they're still sweet. So these are still like occasional foods. You know, if you're baking alternatively, you shouldn't be having baked goods every night of the week. We're talking about Thanksgiving, it's occasional holiday. If you're going to indulge, you know, find a healthier version, but this doesn't mean it's a free for all and you can have it every single day. Um, for bread or rolls, that's really hard. We just try to not serve bread, but I know I'm like, how can you not have bread? Um, there is a keto recipe um, from Stephanie Lincoln, so I'm gonna put that in the email that'll follow the lecture as well. It's actually really good, but it's not dairy-free, so you'll have to find a different recipe if you are on a dairy-free um, version of the diet. Gravy, I know a lot of people just buy like the jar of gravy. That again is gonna be full of like preservatives and chemicals and all this. There actually are some really great gluten-free mixes like that are organic that don't have a lot of preservatives or anything that you just mix with water and stir up on the stove top and it'll thicken. Um, but you definitely can make it. You can use one of these gluten-free flour mixes and then you make, a, it's called a roux with butter and the flour and you can start your gravy and then you can use the broth from the turkey or you can use like bone broth or um, chicken broth or something like that. And for stuffing, there's 
a lot of stuffings are like quinoa based. So quinoa is a pseudo grain. It has more protein than it has carbohydrate content. Um, so you could use that as a base instead of bread. Or you could use the keto bread that's listed above and toast it to make like your little croutons and then use that as a stuffing. Um, but you can also do a stuffing that doesn't have the quinoa or the keto bread. We've had, if you just Google grain-free stuffing, you'll find ones that are full of like nuts and seeds and mushrooms and vegetables and then it still has all the same flavorings because you put the right seasonings in, the poultry seasoning and the herbs in there and it's just as delicious but it doesn't like sit like lead in your gut afterwards. Pumpkin spice, that's like the craze, right? Pumpkin spice, everything is out there. <laughs> Did you ever think that you could just use the actual pumpkin spice seasoning? Yeah, so we do use the little cake cups, the Keurig. We we, use, we make our own Keurig. We have the reusable ones. And so when I put my little coffee in there, I sprinkle pumpkin pie spice on it. And then I put my coconut cream or MCT oil or both in there. And it's delicious. It's just like having a latte. And it tastes the same, but it doesn't have all those like caramel color and high fructose corn syrup and all that yucky stuff in it. So you can have pumpkin spice. You just have to use the spice, not the flavored so we talked about the um, traditional Thanksgiving dinner is about 3,000 calories, but we also want to look at how many carbs there are in. Oh, I forgot to give you the total. So it was like, can does anybody do math really fast? <laughs> 140, 70, 220, 240, 340. So on here there's like 348 grams of carbohydrates. <laughs> 348 grams of carbohydrates. Does anybody have any idea what's like a normal, should be a normal day? Uh, 20. <laughs> well, 50 if you're doing like a moderate. Yeah, 50 or under. under if you don't want to gain weight, it has to be under 50 total grams uh -huh. of, of, car of carbs. So, let's start with turkey. How many grams of carbs does turkey have? Zero. Zero. Right, so you can have your turkey. And then if you put some gravy on it, that's only eight grams of carbs, but it has to be a quarter cup of the gravy. But now when you start getting into some of this other stuff, stuffing has 42 grams. So that's like your whole day's worth of carbs. So if you didn't have anything else and that was all you had for carbs, then you could indulge in the stuffing. The cranberry, okay, and you have to look at the, you have to look at the serving sizes on these. Mashed potatoes is 35 grams. So that's for one cup. Does anybody know how much a cup is? <laughs> how many people only eat, like, do you ever see, put, like, a cute little, like, dollop of, like, uh, mashed potatoes? That's usually, like, your base, right? Like, you put all that on, and then you mash it down, and you make your puddle, your and you pour scoop. the gravy <laughs> and then you put the turkey on. Nobody eats one cup of mashed potatoes. You're all liars. <laughs> Okay, so let's pick on my next favorite one. What in the world is that cranberry sauce in a can that still has the ridges in it? That's so gross. We have the label for that, so we can play with that in a minute. So that has 22 grams of sugar in it, and that's for one slice. <laughs> one little slice. Cornbread, 28 grams. This is the killer. How many people like... Okay, I'm going to say how many people like it. I don't want to out you. How many people's families make, it's their, like a traditional thing to make the sweet potato casserole with the marshmallows on top? Of course. I think mine's My family did it. <laughs> so, 132 grams of carbohydrates in sweet potato casserole. Because the sweet potatoes are starchy, like they have sugar all by themselves. And then there's usually maple syrup and the marshmallows and brown sugar on top of it. And I don't even know what else is in it because I've never made it. Raisins. No, yeah, you can. Yeah. 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 And that's probably the same, like beans. around the same for like candy fumes. If you make that uh, recipe too, so that's mm -hmm. insane. Okay, let's pick up wine for a minute. One glass of you're not so bad if you just have one glass of white wine because it's three grams. You can't have like the whole bottle or like you know the Unless holiday you sized eat. bottle. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you can drink your wine if you want yeah. to, but then you can't have any of the rest of the stuff. Then you're just crying yourself in the corner because you missed it. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, okay, all the people that are crying because they overindulge in carbs in this corner and all the people that drink their carbs over in this corner. <laughs> okay, the pie, of course, pecan pie has a lot 
amount of sugar. Yeah. 64 grams of sugar and pecan pie. Is it pecan or pecan? I have somebody who made a keto um, version oh, really? of it, and I can get that in. Okay, yeah. In so there, she's, what she's saying is there's a keto version for pecan pie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> pumpkin pie, not ours out there, has 41 grams of sugar traditionally, if you make it traditionally. Isn't that like amazing? What did I say? I don't want to add it up again. It was 392. 392 oh, grams yeah. of carbohydrates right there. So what if we took some of those out of there and did the cauliflower <laughs> mash and skipped the bread or did keto bread all together? If you made your cranberry sauce mm -hmm. like we did in the other room, you know, and don't overindulge on the desserts, you know, you'd skip a whole lot of carbohydrates. We could get that down to probably at least a third. Mm -hmm. We would get it back. Okay, so let's do label reading real quick. We've got, I'll cover the name, chili <laughs> cranberry sauce. Does that look like a familiar can in anybody's childhood? You don't have to admit that you've My seen it recently. Oh, you don't have to say families. recently. Oh, uh, okay, so the serving size is a quarter cup and it has 21 grams of sugar, 25 grams of sugar, but in this country, for some reason, we have decided that sugar itself is not sweet enough. And so what we do is we add high fructose corn syrup and corn syrup. So this doesn't even have natural sugar in it, it's all corn syrup. So corn syrup definitely raises your glycemic index and has been linked to diabetes and heart disease and all these other things, neurotoxicity in kids. So I would not need that. It is fun to slide out of the can, actually. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> like a so science experiment. <laughs> when I was little, that was I always wanted to help with that part. Like that was my job, and I would try to get it to come out in one piece and not have to like you know ruin the stripes with the putting the butter knife through it. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, how many people's families? We'll just blame it on our families. It's not us. How many people's families have a tradition of making bean, green bean casserole? Mm -hmm. Of course, my family loves it. But did you know that you could make it without, I don't even know what's in that stuff now. I made it last year with healthy. With green yeah, we make it healthy. You can actually get, there's a box of cream of mushroom soup that is organic and you can get actual green beans and you can just steam them. <laughs> I like that. Actual green beans. You can actually <laughs> buy a green, like a bag of green beans. They sell them like that, not in a can. They're green. They're not brown because they're green beans. Green beans should be green. Um, and then there's recipes where you can just stir fry like onions and get them crispy and put them on top. And you could use like coconut flour or almond meal or something to put a little breading and do it in butter. So there is a way to do it. Um, you can also sneak some mushrooms in there and other vegetables so you can get the kids to like really get a double dosing. Okay, how many people's families, this is a, is a childhood memory. Yeah, so this stuff, I mean, one of the, just look at how long that, that ingredient label. list is. If you didn't even read any of the words in there, like how do they even get that many ingredients in that little box in the first place? You know, like if you were gonna make stuffing, you probably could do it with like six or less ingredients. So there's all sorts of preservatives, there's oil, there's MSG, there's, it actually tells you that there's hydrogenated soybean and or cottonseed oil in there. So this is part of our label reading class. Cotton is not a food. <laughs> I know, I don't even have to say anything else. I'll just leave it at that. Caramel color, why did I have to put caramel color in that? Isn't that stuff already brown to begin with? <laughs> caramel color has been linked to cancer for sure. Um, there's sugar, so they hide sugar in there. There's all sorts of artificial colors. Um, we always pick on, um, in labels, if you see words followed by numbers, that's not food, <laughs> it's chemical, right? So that kind of breaks all of the rules. So you can definitely make delicious uh, stuffing, one of the grain-free versions that we talked about. Maybe if you want it to be a little more starchy, um, do try the keto bread recipe that we'll email out to you guys. So a little comparison, mashed potatoes versus mashed cauliflower, the um, serving size is the same. Uh, 
Mashed potatoes would have 485 milligrams of sodium, where there was only 170 milligrams in the cauliflower. Um, mashed potatoes is 33 grams of carbs, and the cauliflower is only 8 grams of carbs. And then cauliflower actually has more fiber than the potatoes, and has 6 grams of protein, where the potatoes only have 3. So you're doing yourself a whole world of difference, and that one serving would make a whole lot of difference in the whole total of the meal. Um, for some families, if you have fussy eaters and they just are like stick their nose up at cauliflower, what you could do is half and half. And so we've had families be able to sneak the cauliflower in a little bit more successfully if they do part cauliflower and part potato. And then as their little palates change and they get used to it and they start trusting you a little more when you do it later, a week you can do maybe two thirds cauliflower and a third potato and kind of phase yourself out of the, of the potato altogether. So that's a way to do it. Um, with the potatoes, I mean, every if you're not dairy free, everything tastes great with butter and cream. Yes. You can put bacon and scallions and all sorts of stuff, and that'll help with the flavor profile and the expectation of potato versus cauliflower. And then pie crust. Look at these puppies. These are super convenient, aren't they? This will help your meal prep. See how they get us? It's all about the convenience and the time saving, you know. And the problem is that we definitely see a correlation in health, you know, disease factors and risk factors with the with these items becoming readily available. When these weren't available on the shelves and we weren't eating processed chemical laden foods, you know, we didn't see things like diabetes, we, heart disease wasn't on the rise, we didn't see the obesity rates that we have nowadays, definitely didn't see food sensitivities and allergies at the accelerated rates that we're seeing. Do you know that there was a time when there wasn't the word leaky gut that wasn't a thing and Hashimoto's wasn't like a common terminology? So you kind of have to start questioning like what are we putting in our bodies? So now I know that we're talking about holiday and this is a special occasion. And so we definitely aren't proponents of food shaming, you know, or do we tell patients don't put yourself in food jail, that's an ugly lonely place, okay? <laughs> So if you do indulge or you try a few things that you wouldn't normally have, like I know I'm going to, I'm going home for an entire week, you know, I'm not going to control the menu, they're going to let me slide in a couple of my healthy things and then I'll just sample some of the other things and I won't overindulge and have seconds and I won't eat it for the entire week long. But you guys kind of know how we handle some of the food restrictions in our office, so for those of you who aren't yet patients. Um, we don't like we don't count carbs or you know look up graphs and count numbers and add and weigh and measure everything because what we know is people wouldn't be successful for more than a week or two on that kind of a program. But what we do is just kind of count serving sizes. So our patients fill out food logs and then if they ate one of the higher carb items, we just have them circle it. And then we count the number of circles for the week and we're like, okay, if you had 20 this week, do you think you could get 18 next week? And we just slowly decrease it until the patient suddenly is like, you know what, I don't even need bread. And it sounds funny if you're not on a program, but it happens because your chemistry changes, your food addictions, your cravings all change and diminish when your body gets in balance and you feed it real food that it was meant to have. And it does happen. Has anybody had that happen in this room yet? It happens, it really does. I know it sounds funny when you're a new patient and you have all those cravings and you haven't made the changes, because you're like, you can't ever foresee that happening. But it, the problem will take care of itself if you take care of the body. So do you guys have any questions? That actually went super fast. Yeah, go ahead. How do we make a pie crust? How do we make a pie crust? So um, there's an example on the pumpkin pie recipe that's in there. Um, a lot of it is just you can make it with butter and almond meal or hazel meal, hazelnut meal. Some of the pie crusts have dates in it, like you would put the dates and the alternative flour in the um, food processor and mix it up with some of the liquid ingredients. But that's how we do it, yeah. I, I find baking is a little bit harder than just converting from a regular yeah. food because of the, the almond flour and the coconut. Like she was saying, it's drier and then you add more butter. And so it, it just, you know, don't get just discouraged it may not look pretty, but it tastes good. Yeah. That's, that, that's right. it, you know, then once you learn, then it, yeah. it looks better, but. 
you know, that's bad. it's true. Like cook normal cooking on the stovetop, you can taste it and play with it and let it cook a little bit longer. Baking is definitely a chemistry experiment. So everybody that eventually goes over to more, I don't know. <laughs> she had a chemistry experiment. She prepared our beautiful pies so you can thank her after, but she had a little chemistry experiment of herself because if you don't get those liquids and dry ingredients exactly right, it could flop or crack or whatever, but usually people are like, they'll just happy Absolutely. to eat it anyway. So mix up that um, healthy whipped cream that we talked about and just cover all the cracks and exactly. <laughs> parts and everything and nobody will ever know. They'll be glad for it. Yes. One of the things I I've, I've done, and I've been low carb like nine years, I guess, and keto for a couple months. Okay. But um, one of the things that I did is just um, just use alternative things. And like a lot of times, people don't really notice. Like instead of making like a pumpkin pie, I make like a pumpkin fluff, and I make the whipped cream, and I just fold in a little bit of pumpkin and stevia, yeah. and it looks like a pumpkin, and you put a little spice on right. top or decorate it, and right. they're like, ooh, you know. Yeah. And same with the cranberry. I just make it with the, the Knox gelatin that's just regular gelatin yeah. and stevia and real cranberries, and yeah. they don't really think about it. There's so many things on the plate, right. you know. They exactly. just take a whop of it. Exactly. <laughs> A lot of it is the expectation, too, so you kind of have to coach yourself a little bit. Presentation. Yeah, make it look pretty. <laughs> but it is that true. I mean, they did an experiment in the 70s where they would dye, you know, potatoes blue, or they would make butter green, and, like, people <laughs> just by looking at it, it tasted the same. Like, they made sure it didn't affect the flavor, but it wasn't palatable to people because it didn't meet their expectation, right? So that's some of the pickiness and the restriction you'll get from kids and from other family members. Is like it's not what they're used to, and at first they're kind of like back off it. But if you can get them to try it, they usually realize like it's better. delicious, it's <laughs> yeah. fine, it's better, it's better for you for sure. But yeah, that's a good, good suggestion. Anybody else have anything that they've incorporated that they like that they want to share that they think would be helpful for the rest of the audience? We yeah. use uh, arrowroot for thickening. Yeah, and arrowroot is pretty, a good thickener. Pretty, pretty paleo. Absolutely. You know, keto friendly. Yep, arrowroot is common in some of the baking recipes that you'll see. Any other tips or tricks? What is arrowroot? Arrowroot is a powder. It's a root, but it's usually in a tinier jar like your seasonings would be, and it thickens things. Yeah, because otherwise you have to use like cornstarch, corn. Most corn is GMO, corn is inflammatory. A lot of people have um, sensitivities to corn, so you can't really use that. Can you find it at most grocery stores? Or yeah, like oh yeah, it's right in the spices and seasoning section, arrowroot. I wanted to comment what she had said about the um, homemade cranberry sauce that we made next door. I think it's delicious. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's too tart. It's plenty sweet enough. You can even put less honey or the sweetener in it. It's so fun. Did you think it was fun making it when you yeah. were watching those little cranberries? Like, and they pop. They <laughs> pop, so and they, you don't even need gelatin. Like, they just magically start to pop and form this gelatinous whatever. And you yeah. could strain it. If you don't want the skins in there or you want a smoother consistency, you could definitely put it in a food, you know, food purifier or strain some of the skins out of it. But it's actually really That's super fun. fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, it was fun. really fun to make. And you could get kids to do that, like just sit there and stir it. Cause it's like a chemistry experiment. I had no <laughs> idea until like three years ago. I was like, holy cow, look at this. Yeah. I think that's one lesson that you get too when you're cooking yeah. like keto Real type cream. stuff or things like that. Yeah. One, it's fun for sure, but yeah. you definitely have to just leave your pride at the door because yeah. <laughs> right. it's not going to look the same right. at first. <laughs> You'll get used to it, but like she said, it does taste yeah. good, but it's going to be a different experiment in your kitchen for right. sure. It's and a lot of fun. Yeah, there's been plenty of flops, like I said, as people have started <laughs> to convert over to some of these recipes. But on the on the other side of the fence, what I will tell you is the the recipes that are out there nowadays online, when you search put you know, keto or paleo or low carb in front of your favorite recipe, um, they are much better than they used to be, like tried and true and come out, you know, they're I have had much less flops following some of the food bloggers of recent. I think they're doing a lot better job making some of these conversions and making it easy to prepare <laughs> and more palatable as well. Anything else you guys want me to cover? Okay, so like I said, 
And also for the online, um, make sure you message us if you want some of this content. If we don't have your email address, we can definitely send it out to you. Um, we'll prepare the notes from tonight with the list of tips and tricks and conversation starters with family members and how to overcome some of those obstacles. Um, and we'll give you not only the recipes for the mashed cauliflower, the cranberry sauce, and the pumpkin pie that you tried tonight, but we have some other recipes for things like green bean casserole, keto bread, and that that I want to share with you. And we have plenty of time for you guys to get that information, get your grocery ship, get your shipped, get your shipped um, <laughs> membership, put your grocery shopping list together, and get it all in time to prepare a healthy Thanksgiving dinner. So hopefully you found this helpful and we thank you for joining us.